Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and thanks for uh, joining us today. My name is uh, Swetha Chaudhary. I'm a peace activist, PhD student, and a national organizer at the Stop the War Coalition. I'm really honored to be hosting this talk today and really excited. Um, uh, and we have um, uh, the, our guest today is Mark Curtis. And today's talk is organized by the Media Reform Coalition. So the coalition works to bring together dozens of uh, civil society groups, researchers, and media practitioners to develop policies and to campaign for media reform in the light of a communications environment that continues to be dominated by a handful of um, very large, powerful organizations and is characterized by insufficient plurality, diversity and accountability. Um, every year, the coalition puts on a fantastic event called the Media Democracy Festival. However, um, because of uh, COVID-19, the festival was cancelled this year. So instead, they're now hosting a series of online debates on some of the key issues of our times. And today's talk is a part of that. Um, this is the final one of these debates. Um, in the previous sessions, we've already discussed the coverage of economics, the silences and scapegoating that are evident when it comes to media coverage of racism and Muslims and transphobia and platform dominance. Um, Today we are going to concentrate on the role of investigative journalism in uncovering silences about foreign policy that are uh, too often ignored by the mainstream media. Uh, so our speaker today is Mark Curtis. He's an expert on British foreign policy and the author of several books, including uh, Web of Deceit, Unpeople, Dirty Wars and Secret Affairs. He's also the editor of the newly launched um, uh, investigative site Declassified UK, which uh, he'll be discussing in today's talk. Uh, we'll start the talk um, in a minute, but before we move forward, um, I'd just like to request that if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please add it to the comment stream and keep it very clear and concise. Um, so yeah, so let's begin the session now. Uh, Mark, a very uh, warm welcome. Over to you. Oh, thanks very much, uh, Sweater, um, and for Media Reform Coalition for asking me to speak. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk briefly about why Matt Kennard and I have set up uh, Declassified UK. Uh, you know, the overall reason for this is that we in the UK have an enormous problem. I mean, there literally is no functioning information system where people really can find out what UK governments are actually doing in the world. The establishment media is, is simply not serving the public. There is a massive gap in reporting on UK foreign policy. So we've set up Declassified to tell the truth about the UK's role in the world. Um, we're covering mainly military, security, intelligence policies, but also corporations, British environmental policies, development issues. Um, we are biased. We're, we're biased in favor of reporting on the UK's impact on people, uh, on human rights, uh, international justice, free speech, international law. These are the key things for us. We're moderates. We believe in those principles, unlike the extremists currently in power. And I think that our belief in those principles makes us different to the establishment media, which doesn't base its reporting very much on those principles. We've done 66 investigations so far since we began last September um, on our website. They're all there, declassifieduk.org. So far, we've revealed things like secretive UK military programs in Saudi Arabia, how the UK military's greenhouse gas emissions are 11 times larger than the government admits, how the UK is quietly continuing its war in Yemen under coronavirus, how the UK is conducting military training in environmentally protected areas in Belize, how GCHQ is infiltrating British schools and allowing arms companies involved in killing children overseas to teach our children. It's a privilege for me to be working with two amazing investigative journalists at Declassified, Matt Kennard and, and Phil Miller. Matt used to work at the Financial Times, but has since recovered and is now doing amazing work. Phil has just produced a groundbreaking book on UK mercenary operations around the world. And both are brilliant researchers and reporters. We've also got a commissioning budget to allow great journalists to write for us. Uh, we, you know, we want to offer a platform to writers who currently don't have a platform 
either writers in Britain or in countries affected by UK foreign policy. They can be young writers, they can be up and coming or established journalists. And we really welcome pitches for investigations from, from people who want to write for us. We, we see our role as public service journalism because we ourselves are, are fed up with propaganda and fake news. And with the public not being informed what's being done in their name. It's wrong to think of the establishment media as news organizations. They're more corporations with political and financial agendas. And once you understand the media as lobby groups for the establishment, their, their outputs make more sense. The right wing billionaire controlled media are basically lobby groups for the conservative wing of the establishment. The Guardian mainly for the liberal wing of the establishment. These are essentially the false information platforms of the British elite, what, what I call the oligarchy, a uh, highly secretive, elitist, privileged group who basically control state policies. Our system is routinely called democracy in the ideological system, but it really only has a few true democratic elements. And the establishment media reinforces that oligarchy. Now, for anyone that knows much about the UK's role in the world, it's, it's impossible to read the mainstream media as a consumer of news. You can only really look at it as an analyst of misinformation and propaganda. Sadly, the establishment media are doing a very effective job for the oligarchy. Partly, I think, because many people still don't really accept that the media play such a widespread propaganda role. But I think things are changing. And the good news is that more and more people do know what the role of the mainstream media is. There was a poll recently showing that the population who trust the mainstream media is declining, which is a very positive development, in my view. Um, for me and many other people, the, the general election last December was a pivotal moment in, in British life, perhaps akin to the Iraq War of 2003. There may have been several reasons why Corbyn lost that election, but what's clear is that the media mounted the biggest propaganda campaign in British post-war history to ensure that largely popular policies promoted by Corbyn would not prevail. And the real enemy of that campaign was not so much Corbyn as the public. The stakes in that election were incredibly high. Corbyn would have been the first anti-imperialist leader ever to have won power in a major Western country. And this was something that the elite had to stop at all costs. And any smear, however ridiculous it seemed, was allowed to be, uh, was allowed to be published. The, the reason the election was pivotal was that the media clearly revealed themselves essentially as part of the oligarchical state and that serious progressive change cannot happen in the UK without major media reform. That's, that's my conclusion. We at Declassified found 440 articles in the UK press calling Corbyn a threat to national security. And, and during Corbyn's time as Labour leader, there were over 3,000 articles in the UK media covering Corbyn and the IRA, over 12,000 articles on Corbyn and anti-Semitism. This choice of issues was part of this huge propaganda campaign. But the fact that the media largely won the election for the establishment cannot now be mentioned in the media, in the ideological system. It's about as mentionable as the fact that the UK war in Libya has helped spread terrorism to 14 countries, or that Britain is a serial violator of international law or that Whitehall doesn't support human rights in the Middle East, but supports the states repressing them. There, there is some space in the UK establishment media for critical independent reports, but really not very much. Inconvenient facts are, are just routinely buried in our media system, like the, the war in Yemen is a British war. I mean, BAE Systems, Britain's largest arms corporation, and the RAF are a core part of the war. But almost no media coverage states that Yemen is a British war. Try finding articles on the deepening special relationship between Britain and Egypt, or between Britain and Israel, or Britain and Oman. Try finding articles on the UK's special relationship with Saudi Arabia. 
Try finding articles examining the UK's routine disregard for international law or, or any articles examining the UK's role as a rogue state. These don't exist in the mainstream media. Try finding articles suggesting the UK might be anything other than a promoter of international development. Now, I, I recently wrote a, a two-part analysis of the UK press for, for Declassified, which is on our website, trying to quantify how the press really works through statistical research. The conclusion was that Britain's press consistently portrays Britain as a supporter of noble objectives like human rights, democracy, and development, and that the press acts largely as a platform for the views of the UK military and intelligence establishment. You only have to look at the issues covered, how they're covered, who is quoted. And there are very few exceptions. The UK's alliances with repressive regimes are ignored or downplayed in the media, while our official enemies like Russia, China, Iran are endlessly criticized, often accurately. But you can say anything you like about Moscow or Beijing in the media, but not about London. And this is the wrong way around. It's mainly the British government that should be held to account by the British media. And that's our task at Declassified, to hold British governments to account for what they're doing. And it's not just the right wing media that's the problem. The Guardian and the Observer have supported the UK's regime change wars. They fail to report on UK special relationships with many repressive regimes. They provide a propaganda platform for the security agencies. And they run campaigns to demonize Julian Assange, the UK's political prisoner. And all of this, all of this false information, propaganda in the mainstream is done voluntarily with no coercion. It works far better than any conspiracy could. British journalists are the very definition of groupthink and self-censorship. And having this obedient media is the only way that elites can get away with their covert wars, their support for dictatorships, industrial levels of corporate tax avoidance, which London is the center, corporate pollution of the planet by our corporations. If people knew what the UK was actually doing around the world, I think much of it would stop tomorrow. And that, in fact, is something which elites know. And I, I've seen this many times in the declassified files that I've researched for various books. Those files show policymakers thinking that the public must not be allowed to deter them from the policy choices that they've made. And this is why the UK is a state of extreme secrecy, where policymakers don't even think the public should know what they're doing, let, let alone be able to influence them. It also needs to be said that there's no real regulation of the media to speak of. There, there's a thing called the Editor's Code of IPSO, which is meant to regulate the media, which says that the media should be accurate and that, for example, it should not publish headlines unsupported by the text in the articles. If that were applied, every mainstream outlet would be shut down tomorrow. There's numerous cases, constant routine cases of inaccuracy and headlines not being supported by the text. My, my view is that there's only run, one reason why people might think the establishment media is doing a reasonable job covering Britain's role in the world, and that's if they don't know enough about it. And it would probably not be their fault if they don't know much about it, because we, the public, are being kept largely in the dark. We, we've got literally dozens of stories at, at Declassified that we could do tomorrow um, because there's so little coverage of, of UK foreign policy anywhere in the media. There's a few key things about our work that I wanted to flag up, which I think is maybe a bit different than some other organisations. Um, as everyone knows, this is an era of mass information and fake news. Our work is strictly accurate. I mean, all of our investigations go through extremely rigorous checking and editing. Unlike the mainstream media, we'll issue an immediate correction if we get anything wrong, but we're doing deep, accurate investigations. We don't particularly see ourselves as a news organization. We're doing analysis and investigations on issues that we think the public are interested in and that are in the public interest. Now, I mean, every, every media outlet likes to say that its journalism is independent and fearless. You see that all the time. But the difference with us is that in our case, it's true. 
Um, for one thing, we won't take money from governments or corporations. We're a not-for-profit group funded solely by foundations and people to whom we are hugely grateful, by the way. The other thing is that we're not going to compromise our independence and integrity by working with the mainstream media. We're, we're not going to partner with the mainstream media to, to jointly publish our investigations. We see the mainstream media as part of the problem faced by the public, and we're encouraging others to challenge and reform the traditional media, not, not to collaborate with it. We, we think that independent media like us are, are really the future. We need a, a plurality of independent media in the UK to provide a public service to, the, to, to people. And I think the work being done by uh, media outlets like The Ferret, Open Democracy, Middle East Eye, New Internationalist, Navara, The Canary and others is really important. We want to help build up independent, non-corporate media by working with other progressive outlets, journalists, academics and NGOs. And of course, with the Media Reform Coalition, whose analysis and calls for media reform are, are all the more important as we, as we go forward. And we also see the need for constant innovation. So we really welcome feedback and suggestions on, on what declassified should cover and, and how. Um, and you know, I'd say to people, please follow us and, and, and do give us that, that feedback. So that's all I wanted to say for now. And, and yeah, happy to, take, happy to take questions and comments. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for such a fantastic and um, thought-provoking contribution. Um, you've made some really interesting and important points. Um, for example, you began by talking about how the mainstream media is a source of misinformation and disinformation and like a lethal weapon for the establishment. Uh, and you're completely right. And that was shown in the last four years in the way Jeremy Corbyn was vilified and demonized by the mainstream media. Uh, it was not just appalling on an individual level, but also so damaging to the spirit of democracy, um, because as a result, many voters chose to ignore the facts, um, bought the propaganda that the right wing media sold to them and uh, voted for Boris Johnson, who has previously uh, made several racist, uh, homophobic, sexist uh, uh, comments. Uh, turning to the questions I have for you, uh, recent public polls have shown that the British public sees the mainstream press as the most right wing in Europe. So my first question is, to what extent do you think the public can and do choose to ignore mainstream media and political debates and rely on their own judgment and common sense when forming opinions? And what do you think is the future of investigative journalism in this hostile political environment? Right, yeah, well, they're both very good questions. Um, I mean, the, the issue of to what extent are people influenced by the media is actually a huge question. I mean, I think at one level, they're hugely influenced, and that, that's on the questions of what people are told to think about. You know, what are the issues that dominate the media on any given day? Um, the UK, for example, has contributed to 100,000 deaths in Yemen over the last four years. Few people are thinking about that. Why, why is that? Well, may, maybe it's because some people don't care, but I think many people would care if they were constantly told the truth about the UK's role in that slaughter of people. You know, if they knew about the detailed role being played by the Royal Air Force or about the BAE systems in keeping the Saudi uh, war machine going, directly facilitating those killings. You know, if that was on BBC News every other day, that would be something that people would be thinking about. But the fact is that people are you know, largely kept in the dark about what's going on in the world in, 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 in which Britain is involved. And that kind of sin of omission, what the, what the media doesn't talk about is really significant. I mean, personally, I think that uh, people are, are certainly capable of exercising judgment and don't simply believe what they read in the media. Uh, but when people are constantly bombarded with the same message, like, you know, that Corbyn is a terrorist, Corbyn is a Marxist, Corbyn hates the UK, he's an anti-Semite. I mean, th th those messages tend to then, I think, begin to indoctrinate people. People begin to think, well, there's no smoke without fire. You know, it's the basic principle of advertising. If you repeat 
constantly repeat the message, and then people eventually end up believing it. And I think our media tends to work like that, I mean, you know, both in terms of what what's covered in the media and 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 how it's covered. Um, I think the, your other question about investigative journalism. I mean, in some ways, this is under huge threat. I mean, for two reasons actually. I mean, one one is what's happening to Julian Assange and Belmarsh. Uh, there seems no doubt that the U.S. administration and the British government want to. Um, make a an example of of Julian Assange. Uh, you know they want to punish uh, WikiLeaks for revealing state crimes that are actually in our interest. Um, and th this this could send it is already sending a terrifying message to I think other journalists and to anyone interested in actually revealing what our governments are doing around the world. This literally is about criminalizing journalism. And, and if, this, if, if the extradition of Julian Assange goes ahead, I think it will be horrendous for the future of uh, journalism and particularly investigative journalism. And, but I also think this is a great example actually of how media propaganda has worked because you know, a huge propaganda campaign has been mounted by the, by the media over the last few years to demonize uh, uh, Assange. Uh, saying that he's an ally of the Kremlin, that he's a cutout for Russia and all this nonsense, which is just com complete fabrication. Um, and, and the reason for that is because they, they know that actually what WikiLeaks and Assange have done is in the public interest. You know, it is in our interest to have the, the crimes of our states revealed. It's not in our interest for, for the states to get away with those crimes. So this is a hugely important issue. And the, the other thing is, and, and when we had an article on this written by Richard Norton Taylor, the former Guardian journalist, um, on our, uh, had an article on our website a, a few days ago, that there are, the government does have plans to, to in effect, criminalize journalism. And it plans to introdu introduce a, a, an espionage act that would make it much harder for investigative journalists to reveal key information in the public interest. Um, and. Uh, and I find it, it's, it's very significant that these attacks on journalism by the UK government are going on at the time when the government is rhetorically championing global media freedom. You know, a year, year or so ago, the, 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 the government embarked upon this big process where it was claiming to champion global media freedom and has, has worked with Canada and other governments to bring together this international conference in London, um, where it says that it supports media freedom around the world. Well you know, whilst clamping down on it at home, you know, whilst actually supporting governments like Egypt, for example, who are unprecedentedly clamping down on free and independent journalism in their countries. So there's a huge propaganda campaign going on by the government to convince us that it's for media freedom when it's clamping down on it. And I mean, all I can say is that, you know, we at Declassified are not gonna be deterred <laughs> by, by what the government is doing. You know, it's in the public interest to, to for, for government policies to be exposed, and that you know that's our role. And I think that's why people are interested in reading our uh, our analyses. Yeah, thank you. We have so many questions um, from the audience, but I'll take this first question from Hannah Graham from YouTube, and she's asking, uh, how much suppression of information do you believe the UK government is actively engaged in within the British press? And the second part is, how can the media hold the government accountable? Yeah, I mean, I think there is there is some repression of information. Um, you know, there's this thing called the DSMA committee, which was used to be called the, the D-Notice committee, where um, the, the government will try and stop the media publishing information that it deems to be against um, national security interests. And that can easily be abused by um, a government not wanting embarrassing information to come out. The interesting thing about that system is it's purely voluntary. I mean, the media that are part of that system and who abide by that system are voluntarily censoring themselves. I mean, that in itself is an indictment, I think, of the mainstream media. You know, we're, we're not, we at Declassified are not going to go anywhere near that committee. We're not going to we're not going to censor information because the government says that it's not in, in the national security interests of the UK. We know that the government uses this term national security as an umbrella term to prevent uh, good information reaching the public. 
Um, but actually, I don't think that this is the primary reason why good information doesn't reach the public. It's not because the government is telling journalists not to say X or Y. Journalists self-censor. They, they stop themselves um, analyzing certain issues. You know, why is it that there's no articles in the British media that look at the UK's deepening support for Israel or Egypt? Hardly any in terms of Egypt. There's been one or two uh, articles actually, still not covering the full extent of the deepening British across the board relationship with Egypt. And none, as far as I know, on the UK's deepening military relationship um, with Israel, for example. Now, wh why is that? No, no one is phoning up a, an editor and saying, you must not cover you know, the UK's relations with Egypt or Israel or Saudi Arabia or Oman or Bahrain or any of the other dictatorships that the UK is supporting. You know, th this is self-censorship. And I, I think it works kind of similarly to, I mean, anyone that's worked in an organization can can surely understand this. You know whether it's a whether it's a corporation, whether it's an NGO. You you know what the red lines are. You know what it's permissible to say and what it's what it's harder to say. What it's what you can get away with saying and, and, and what's what's more sensitive. The thing is that we like to think that you know our journalists are, are fearless in that they they will say anything provided it's the truth and they'll go and look for the truth. But unfortunately they. Are, are just as subject to those, that sort of self-censorship and, and, and I think groupthink as, 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 as anyone else. And that's, that's the problem we have. What we, what we really need is those fearless and independent journalists. Thanks, Mark. Wow, we have so many questions. Um, the next one is from Ilias Statatos. I hope I've pronounced the name correctly. It's from YouTube and he's asking, what do you think is the independent media's role in pushing back against journalism that leads us towards the second Cold War? Yeah, the media, the media's role is absolutely fundamental in this. Um, we don't have a governance system that holds governments to account. You know, parliament is largely in the pockets of the executive. There's very little independent scrutiny going on uh, by parliament of what the government is actually doing. Um, to you know, the, the UK system is more of an oligarchy, in my view. Some people call it an elective dictatorship. The government, you know, we, we have extreme secrecy in the UK, where the government doesn't even need to tell us half the things it's doing. Um, even when it does tell us what it's doing, there's very little scrutiny by Parliament of of that. You only have to look at the all party parliamentary committees that are meant to scrutinise government policy. They very rarely do that. They're meant to do that on behalf of the public. They're not doing it. What that means is that the role of the media becomes even more important because, you know, it, it's, it's from the media that the public will get good information. And, but it, 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 it's incumbent upon us as independent journalists to give the public that information. But I think it's also incumbent on us to challenge and reform the current establishment, traditional media, because they are playing such an insidious, pernicious role. You know, whilst millions of people are still reading the Times, the Mail, the Telegraph, watching BBC, reading the Guardian, and thinking they're being told this is the reality about you know of what's going on in the world in terms of in terms of UK policy. Whilst millions of people are doing that, we're going to have an uninformed public, and you know, independent media has to both do that journalism and it has to challenge the the establishment traditional media who, who are claiming to do um, journalism, but really not in many cases. Thanks, Mark. Um, the tech guys have asked me to ask you <laughs> to move the wire away from your shirt. I think it's rubbing against your shirt. And Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, I want to move to foreign policy now. And so, which brings me to my second question. 
Uh, in the last six months, the Labour Party has sadly reverted back to being how it was before Corbyn. And now we have Estama as leader who has managed to shift the parliamentary Labour Party at least to the right. Um, there are growing fears within the movement that Corbyn's heart for socialist legacy will soon be lost if we don't fight back with the PRP. Now, if that happens, one of the major setbacks would be on foreign policy. So my question is, following Corbyn's departure, do you think the Labour Party can be a vehicle for advancing an ethical foreign policy in the UK? Um, it, it could be, but it won't be. Uh, I think it's a short answer to that question. Uh, there's, there's no chance under current circumstances that Labour is going to promote an ethical foreign policy. Uh, you know, Labour is committed to arms exports. It's committed to bolstering the arms industry. It's committed to a special relationship with the US. It's committed to aircraft carriers for uh, power projection overseas. It's committed to nuclear weapons. Um, and, you know, if you look at the top lines of uh, Labour's foreign policy proposals, they are, they are deeply worrying. I mean, the only hope with a Labour government in its current form would be that the foreign that its foreign policy might be sort of slightly less catastrophic than the Conservatives. But actually, there's 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 really little chance of that um, of that happening if you look at post-war history. Um, you know, Labour has been traditionally as imperialist and as abusive of human rights in its foreign policy as the Conservatives over the decades. Uh, you know, to take one example, um, you know, the Wilson government in the in the late 1960s, kind of an example of old Labour before Blair, was one was very possibly the worst post-war government in in British history when it comes to promoting ethical foreign policies. You know, it armed Nigeria as the Nigerian government was slaughtering millions of people in the Biafra War. It started the process of depopulating the Chagos Islands. It armed Iraq as Iraq was slaughtering the Kurds in the late 1960s. It even aided the Indonesian generals in 1965 to conduct a genocide that killed hundreds of thousands of people in Indonesia. Most people won't know about these episodes because they've been written out of history pretty much. Um, that was Wilson. You know, that was, that was, that was a Labour government. Uh, you know, we could talk about Atlee. Could talk about Atlee's war in Malaya. We could talk about, you know, Blair, Blair's war in Iraq. Um, you know, I, the fact is that for now it's all over for Labour. I mean, I, Cor Corbyn was a, a once in a hundred year, um, I think, chance to for Labour to promote decent, moderate policies promoting human rights and international law. And I think it's pretty much over now. And I think that we have to look outside the outside, yeah, the formal system to be able to to get our political parties to promote positive policies and to um, press for those and and actually to probably even more important to change the actual governance system to make it truly democratic to make governments accountable to the public in the way that they're not at the moment we can't have the media as it is currently we can't have an oligarchical governance system both of those things need to be democratized. Otherwise, there's no chance of having ethical foreign policies. Yeah. And I think a part of the problem is our special relationship with the US, which is why we, we are, you know, um, we're so uh, engaged in the arms trade and, and in, in the military industrial complex. So the next question is related to this. It's, uh, it's from YouTube from Samatar. Always, hopefully, again, I pronounce his surname correctly. He says he's very interested in the military industrial complex, and he has two questions. The first one is Why is our military so closely linked with the US military? And the second is Are there any books I can read to be more aware? Um, well, the British military industrial complex is closely intertwined with the US military industrial complex, yes. Part of the reason for that is that there's a lot of money in it. Um, you know, UK arms companies benefit hugely from US military spending. You know, BAE Systems, the largest arms producer in the UK, has a massive US operation. So, you know, the US, the, the, the insanely large US military budget 
is great for British arms corporations because it it keeps them in in, in profits. Um, but of course, the other reason is that the the UK and the US are pretty much twin to the hip when it comes to um, foreign policy. You know, they have chosen for decades to essentially jointly rule the world by force. You know, going back to uh, the late 1940s, Britain chose in 1947, 1948 to overwhelmingly put its faith in the special relationship with the US in order to maintain its great power status. You know, it toyed with the idea of becoming a third way between the USSR and the USA for a couple of years at the end of the Second World War. And then the government realized that actually it was incredibly weak at the end of the Second World War, and it just did not have the independent power to, um, to be a third force. So what it did instead was it, 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 it essentially offered itself as a junior partner to US global power. And, you know, if you look at the record, Britain acquired nuclear weapons partly to uphold its position to, towards the US, to tell Washington that Britain was still a major power in the world. And now you look at Britain's covert forces around the world and they, they act often as the kind of the, the covert wing of an Anglo-American military. The UK covert forces can do things which US covert forces can't because in the US they have this weird thing called accountability for their covert forces. Even in the US system, you know, um, you can ask questions about them and actually get answers from, from, their, uh, from, from their governance system. In the UK, there's total silence, the total secrecy. You, you can't ask anything about our covert forces. So, you know, they're involved in seven covert wars around the world, but we have no idea what they're doing. Uh, it's, it's a disaster. It's part of the oligarchy. Mm. Um, and, you know, the US and the UK have uh you know that the, the, the other key interest that they have is in upholding the western corporate or, or the global the global economic system which really functions in the interest of western corporations and these really are the twin goals of the uk i mean if you look at it if you look back through the historical record and think what what what, what do british elites want from the world you know what what's their grand strategy in the world there are two there are two key priorities that, that shine through these declassified files. One is to remain a global power, which partly is to do with uh, maintaining the special relationship with the UK, with the US, having nuclear weapons, intervening all the way around the world and so on, um, maintaining a seat at the UN Security Council. The, the other major goal is to ensure that the global economy functions in the interests of British and Western corporations. The best way to kind of police the world or rule the world is to do that in collaboration with the world superpower, which is the US. And so Britain has chosen to do that. It's actually catastrophic, not only for us, but for the rest of the world. You know, it would be better if we had special relationships with other countries uh, mm -hmm. than the world's, uh, <laughs> you know, rather than the US and Saudi Arabia, for example, who are probably our two key closest relationships and uh, really not very good for either us or, or other people. Thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Declassified UK, and there's a really good question from uh, Anne Catherine from Facebook, and Catherine Michaels from Facebook. So she's asking, how do you guys get information directly to your audience, and how can we reach a wider audience outside of big tech platforms? Um, well, we, we get information directly to our audience in, in, in a very simple way. I mean, just by publishing on our publishing on our website, and then by um, publishing on social media. Uh, you know, we've been pretty active on Twitter. We're increasingly active on Facebook. So you can follow us on Facebook. We have a YouTube channel. Um, those, are the main, those, those are the main ways that we disseminate our information. We, we want to drive more and more people towards those channels, obviously. We want to get, we want to get a big audience. You know, we, we want people to, to, to see what, what we're writing. We think it's important. We think, we think people will be interested. Um, it's important that people consult a variety of, uh, of, of independent information um, outlets, I think. Uh, you know, certainly rather than, you know, what we have at the moment is we have a system where millions of people are still reliant on one or two sources of information. You know, still a lot of people buy a daily newspaper. Thankfully, that's decreasing. A lot of people watch BBC News and actually think they're watching the news. They might only occasionally consult 
uh, independent media online. Now, I know that for many people probably watching this program, that might that might seem a bit weird because, you know, the younger generation and increasingly large numbers of people are looking online and they do look at a, a large numbers of a, a variety of, of sources of information. That's what really everyone should be doing because, you know, we should be applying our rational judgment and consulting a range of different different voices with different information and then weighing up, you know, which is right and, which, you know, which is wrong not being taken in by you know relying on one or one or two um sources um i think i've forgotten the second part of that question sweater um what was it sorry <laughs> there's so many questions i can't find oh how can we reach a right audience outside big tech platforms yeah. yeah that's a good question isn't it <laughs> um i'm not sure i have a very good answer to that that's all I can really say. I mean, I think at the moment we are we are unnervingly reliant on big tech platforms, and uh, who are who can easily manipulate us. Um, we do need to find ways to to speak to each other directly. I, I would I, I would like to be I'd like to be informed myself about how we can do that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a similar question from Lucy Taylor on Facebook when she asks, what can campaign groups do to promote getting the truth out and help you, for example, help Declassify UK in getting the material out and the information out? How can campaigning groups help you? Yeah, that's also a really good question because we, uh, I mean, you know, my background has been in the kind of NGO kind of advocacy, kind of close to campaigning world. And what I'm doing at the moment is very different. I mean, you know, Declassified is a pure journalism outfit. We're not doing any campaigning or lobbying, and we're not interested in doing that. You know, we're simply interested in, in analyzing information and, and then providing that to the public. But we are we are keen for that information to be picked up, at least, by campaign groups. Um, and potentially, we are interested in collaborating with some campaign groups who are open to working with us and who are open to you know, to doing good, solid investigative journalism, because, you know, at the end of the day, it is about taking this information out to to, to a wide audience. I mean, I, I would say that campaigning groups need to, A, continue to do what they're doing. B, they need to, I think they need to stop relying on the mainstream media themselves. I can understand why when campaign groups have spent a lot of time producing a report they just want to maximize the coverage that they get for that for that report so they take it to the usual suspects you know they'll take it to the guardian take it to you know the mail sometimes because they have big audiences i, I would ask them to really rethink that um yeah. and and not to collaborate with those organizations but instead instead to come to independent media groups like us who actually share the same agenda that they have in terms of at least you know, wanting to genuinely inform the public and having an informed citizenry, rather than working with propaganda outlets who, who have no interest yeah. you know, underlying things in the kind of values and principles that drive those campaigning groups in the first place. They shouldn't be collaborating with the mainstream media. And, and, I, you know, and we are open, we are very open at Declassified to, to publishing Great material that the, the, the cam, that campaign groups have you know have produced, provided it goes through our strict um, editing and quality control and you know all that um, process. Yeah. We're certainly keen on doing that. Can I just add one other thing? Um, campaign groups need, in my view, to it depends on the subject, but um, we don't have a governance system which uh, is democratic. Uh, not really. And I think there are all sorts of implications of that. I think that nonviolent direct action, civil disobedience can play a really important role. I think it depends on the issue. Um, but on major issues like environmental policies, which are leading us to catastrophe, on, on British wars and military industry, which is really harming human rights uh, around the world, on things like you know industrial levels of global tax avoidance, where London is the centre, I think on big issues like this, civil disobedience, nonviolent direct action are, are, can be justified. And I think that groups like you know Greenpeace and others have um, 
you know, have shown that you can, you can have impacts and, and the public is sympathetic to taking those sorts of actions, you know, if they're done, if they're done properly on the right issues. And I think that, you know, many campaign groups should consider if they're not already, uh, consider, you know, doing those kinds of, doing, doing that kind of work. Yep. Thanks. Um, talking about, um, um, non-violent ways of like protesting and things like that. The Black Lives um, Matter movement is like the topic of, um, you know, we, we, we're seeing protests all over the world with what happened with, uh, to George Floyd. And there's a question on uh, from YouTube from Masamba Masanga. And he asks, how uh, have you done any research in regards to British imperialism in Africa um, and slash do you plan to? Um, well, I personally have done lots of work on that uh, over the years. Um, too much to maybe summarise, but yeah, Brit British imperialism in Africa—that's a—that's a big topic. Um, we we are we we do want to cover that issue. We 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 want to look at current British policies uh, in countries like South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Egypt, uh, and others. We have published work uh, on Nigeria recently. We, we did an analysis of the declassified files on the Labour government's role in supporting the Nigerian government in its brutal campaign to stop Biafran independence in the late 1960s. The, the Yemen of its era, when up to three million people died and they were supported, the, the Nigerian federal government was supported by the, by the Labour government through secret arms supplies. We did a story recently also about uh, about Nigeria and uh, the role of Shell uh, in um, the executions of the Ogoni protesters uh, in 1995. Um, and we, we welcome, actually, and we're sort of putting out pitches now, we welcome uh, people approaching us to do stories about the British role in Africa. And this is a pretty under-examined area, actually, in the post-war period. You know, there's lots of um, there's been lots of policies. There's been lots of interventionary policies by the by the British in Africa that haven't seen very much of the light of day. I've covered some of them in my in my books. M most people will know about the 1950s British role uh, in 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 Kenya, countering the so-called Mau Mau movement. Very brutal British policies, killing probably hundreds of thousands of people through horrible incarceration and mass mass terror, really, starvation. Um, Britain set up pretty much an apartheid state in Kenya in the 1940s and 1950s. A lot of the information about that war has come out in the last couple of years, but only thanks to really to one American academic, um, Caroline Elkins, who wrote this amazing book a few years ago, um, but there are many other British policies in Africa we also need to see the light of day. Um, so yes, I mean, this is, this is the short answer. We, we, we really do want to cover those issues. The, the, just to add one thing quickly, um, I did a study a couple of years ago with the NGO War on Want. This was before, before Declassified, where I looked at the number of British mining companies actually operating in Africa. Um, I did a lot of number crunching research and found that companies listed on the London Stock Exchange control about one trillion dollars worth of African mineral resources. When you look at gold and um, coal, diamonds, mm -hmm. uh, basically Africa's wealth is pretty much in the hands of UK listed corporations who are often tax avoiders. Um, many, many of those companies uh, are even incorporated uh, in tax havens. This is, this is current day imperialism where, where corporations are controlling the wealth of, of Africa and using that mineral wealth for the benefit of their shareholders and for the benefit of people in tax havens. <laughs> Uh, the, the infrastructure associated with tax havens. This is a really underlooked at area. And, and the whole area of British corporations working in, in, in Africa and, and in other parts of the world which are mineral rich, um, 
that's a that's a key issue that we are also interested in looking at. So we yeah we'd also welcome people promote uh, pr proposing investigations on those issues actually. Amazing. Uh, we've got like literally 11, 10 minutes left. So I'll take um, two more questions. And if you try to keep them concise, so we can maybe squeeze in a third question, we'll see. So this is from a couple of people. Um, and it's, sim it's a similar question both, both of them have asked. And that is, do you have any advice for aspiring journalists? Yeah, question. right for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, don't uh, you can you can join the mainstream media join the mainstream media see how it works and then leave and tell the rest of the world how it works do that and that's pretty much what i did by working at chatham house you know I, I started off when i was in my late 20s i think working at the royal institute of international affairs chatham house this sort of you know ultra establishment think tank that poses as an independent think tank. It's really semi-official kind of part of the state in a way. Um, and uh, that was a great insight to me to see how the establishment, kind of establishment academics actually work and how much they're co-opted by the, by the state. I, I, I think it's, it's very useful to get that experience of working in the establishment, um, provided that you don't stay in it, provided that you don't get co-opted by it, because you know, the rewards can be great. Uh, financial rewards. Uh, you can win awards. You can earn lots of money by writing nonsense. Um, but the key thing is to um, to keep your integrity and actually to say things that really people don't want to hear because that's that's mainly what journalism is about. It's it's saying things that are uncomfortable to the powerful, uh, and that's very difficult to do if you're a, if you're a mainstream journalist. So I, I would say, but if you're not going to start off in the mainstream, then pick out some key independent media organizations that you're keen to keen to write for. Some of them do pay, you know, I mean, we, we pay our, our independent journalists. Um, so, you know, there is, there, is, there is some money available in the system. Um, so I, I, would suggest that, I would suggest that people follow their, follow their integrity. Take two more questions, um, one on Declassified UK and the other one I'll ask on foreign policy, the last question. But um, this is from Amaya Ru from Facebook, and she asks, to what extent do intercultural strategies play a role at Declassified UK? Any idea what you mean by intercultural strategies? Um, I think she, well, I'll, I'll read out what she's written. Okay. It appears the mainstream media as we know it makes it easy to disseminate information that creates a face for the UK to the public that is worlds apart from the reality of its actions abroad. As a result, perceptions of identity are enhanced by this. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not necessarily entirely sure what, what the question means there, but um, I mean, I can say one, one practical thing, which is that, uh, which is very practical and may not be what the question means, but we, that, we, we, we are very keen to, to take analyses and to, to, to promote investigations by, by people who don't get represented in the traditional media, which tends to be white, white men. You know, we, the, the UK is, is more diverse than that. And we want to, we want to reflect that in, in our reporting. We, we also want to encourage and promote journalists in countries affected by British foreign policy. You know, so we want to find great journalists in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Venezuela, in Colombia, uh, in, in, in India to, to write for us, to feel that they have a platform to be able to express themselves about the true nature of British foreign policy in their country. It seems to me that there's very few platforms for people to be able to do that, or at least there are very few platforms in the UK to, to be able to do that. Mm. So we, we are very we are very keen to do that. Um, okay. And I guess it's like the final question and it's quite topical. So um, hang on one second. Um, wanted to talk about the recent attack in Reading. Um, so in light of that and the several other uh, attacks in Manchester and London Bridge in the past, um, the terrorist attacks, could you discuss the link between UK's um, foreign policy slash overseas military operations and domestic terrorism? And secondly, what role does the mainstream media play in 
suppressing or concealing the UK's history of controlling foreign governments, especially in the Middle East, and the UK's involvement in an ongoing conflict such as um, Yemen, which you discussed before, and how do you account for the silences in the mainstream media's coverage for British foreign policy? Sorry, that was long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but that's, yeah, so those are some big subjects. I mean, I, th I think, first of all, maybe on the Reading attack, I mean, as far as I understand it, it's, it's maybe a bit unclear whether it was really a a terrorist attack as such. Uh, it could be that uh, I think the information is still coming out. So uh, what what the motivations for that attack were, I think are a bit unclear to me at the moment. I mean, clearly the attack is just completely horrendous and despicable. Whoever it was and whatever their professed uh, reasons for it. Um, so I mean, this link between foreign policy and terrorism is something which I've, you know, spent a lot of time working on over the last few years. And, you know, my my view is that there are essentially two links between the UK foreign policy and terrorism in the UK. There's one which is more spoken about and one which is much less spoken about. The, the one that's more spoken about is that some jihadists who have undertaken horrendous attacks in the UK have been inspired to do that by um, have been inspired inspired to attack the West by almost as a kind of revenge for Western policies in the Middle East. And in fact, that's something which I think large numbers of people are aware of. It's something which Tony Blair was actually warned of in advance of the invasion of Iraq, that it could inspire terrorism to happen in the UK. I think that that sort of inspiration has, as I say, had more attention than the second link between domestic terrorism and UK foreign policy, which I think in many ways is more serious. And this is a sort of a link that's been virtually buried in the mainstream media, which is that, you know, British governments have for decades colluded with radical Islamist forces, including terrorist organizations. You know, they've, they've worked alongside them and they've sometimes trained and financed them in order to promote objectives. I mean, I, I tried to document this in, in my, my, my book, my, my last book, Secret Affairs, which looked at British collaboration with Islamist actors in Bosnia and Kosovo and Syria, Afghanistan, Libya, um, quite a few examples. Um, you know, most obvious um, examples that we... we that have received less coverage in recent years have been the UK's covert role in Syria, for example, where Britain has covertly supported groups working alongside jihadists and may have even directly supported jihadist groups. It certainly helped to empower those forces. Um, the same largely happened in the Libya war of 2011, where Britain saw Islamist actors as their, as their ground troops, essentially, in the operation to defeat Gaddafi. And that, that war in Libya was, was supported by virtually the entire mainstream elite, uh, media and political. And, and it's had enormous consequences. You know, after the war, Islamic State was able to set up terrorist training camps in Libya, which trained numerous jihadists to then can go on to conduct operations, terrorist operations in Europe, including the Manchester bomber. You know, the Manchester bomber of 2017 was almost certainly trained in one of those camps in Libya that didn't exist before Britain and NATO removed Gaddafi in 2011. And in fact, those training camps in Libya have, have, have struck all over the world. Sorry to interrupt, you've got like a minute, so go on, but yeah. Yeah, no, I was gonna say those terrorist camps in Libya, which didn't exist before our war in Libya, have, have, have um, been involved in terrorist attacks all over the world. And the, the British elite, political elite have never been held to account for the for that Libya war, for supporting it. Um, and that's one of the ways in which neither the governance system nor the media holds our policymakers to account for the often horrendous reality of their policies. And that, that's what we are trying to do at Declassified. And I think that's why a lot of people are following us because they share the importance of that same objective. 
Well, I guess we will have to conclude with that because we literally have like a few seconds left now. But thank you um, so much for that outstanding talk. And it was a really good discussion. And we hope to see more stuff on this Classified UK. Just a quick announcement before we um, leave. Um, Media Reform Coalition is a voluntary organization um, uh, that survives mostly on thin air and some kind donors. So please, please, please consider donating and supporting them as they're doing some groundbreaking work. And also follow Mark on Twitter and support Declassified UK so he can continue his work. And that is all. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye. Bye.